Did the CCP use the illusion of a Biden deal with the big guy to lure Hunter, a known coattail rider, into attempting a business deal, the details of which would later be released as a means to curry favor with the Trump administration, perhaps on the precondition that Trump stopped calling COVID the China virus? So this was all set up by the Chinese to keep from getting blamed for their Wuhan release of the virus. Well, I had a, an interesting experience over this past weekend. Uh, I said last week that I was heading down to Louisiana for a wedding. That's how it starts. Yeah, that is how it starts. Uh, yeah, so me and my girlfriend head down there. We go to the Friends of the People Getting Married's house. And it is like, it's basically the Candyland Ranch from Django Unchained. Like, it was, <laughs> it was, they were like cosplaying from the movie the help welcome to louisiana baby <laughs> oh yeah it's first off like you go it's like it's a plantation house like a straight up like a big sprawling estate this beautiful beautiful freaking house um this perfect family walks out they're all dressed very well you know the 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 wife has like all sorts of uh, a plastic surgery done the husband's very trim and proper they bring their two hitler youth sons out there and they give their script. Hello. My name is Todd. Hello. My name is, you know, whatever their <laughs> names were. Uh, they like bring us into the house to introduce. And there's this old black woman in the kitchen and like, they just don't introduce her. And I walk over there and I was initially like, Oh, I don't talk to this person. <laughs> They're not, she's not a person, Tony. She doesn't have the same rights as a person. She, she wasn't, she was, she was literally their help. And it was like, you know, this giant, big, beautiful white family. And there's this old black woman in the kitchen. And actually it was like my girlfriend initially, she was like, hi, I'm, and I was like, Hey, you know, I, I like, I started talking to her and, and she was, it was like, I, like, like I said, like a movie. She's like, Oh honey. Yeah. You going to try some of this. Uh, it was like this, uh, pastry wrapped brie, uh, with blueberries, like this, this real oh, sweet God. brie dish. <laughs> And I was like, I, I, did, I had like caramel over it. And I was like, what's this? And she's like, oh, honey, this is Brie. And I, I made it up. That, you know, like this, the the quintessential Southern black woman voice. And uh, and then, yeah, like we see her later, like as the party's going on, she's like folding son's clothes in one of the bedrooms while everybody's out there hanging out and having a good time. It was, uh, uh, yeah. And then we go to another house the next day. So that was like the, the rehearsal wedding. We go to an even bigger house the next day. This dude has a 75 acre private lake where he has people drive him around so he can jet ski behind the boat. And it's, I don't know. It was just I, I, like, that's when my, my, I, I started getting a little rebel. I don't talk politics with my girlfriend hardly at all. Can't imagine why. <laughs> yeah, this this is when my re <laughs> my revolutionary started coming up. I was like, nobody needs this. Like they shut off like ten thousand dollars worth of fireworks. Oh my God, <laughs> Louisi Louisiana is interesting. Um, so my girlfriend's brother he kind of pointed this out to me. I, I I didn't really notice it until he said something like, "You're driving down the road, and up here you don't have like trailers mixed with million dollar homes, but down there you do. You'll be driving down the road, and you'll see like you know a bunch of." modest houses you know like something like you know your house or, or like the old house that i had uh you know just like nice normal houses and then you'll see like this giant freaking mansion that's like set back off the road a little bit and i'm sure they have like you know rich communities poor communities but the wealth disparity is really on display and so i'm sitting at this giant white beautiful mansion that had a billiard room they had a library a 75 acre private lake and you can see like across the road like these kind of dilapidated houses and i, I was just like oh like they should have tried harder yeah they should have tried <laughs> harder they should have tried they, they could shoot off you know uh they can shoot off ten thousand dollars worth of fireworks and you know feed this giant group of people bacon wrapped shrimp and all this other just crazy <laughs> food it was it was indulgence and decadence to the extreme you know i was a uh, yeah, yeah, it was like uh, Hunter Thompson, Kentucky Derby is decadent and depraved. Baton Rouge is decadent and depraved, at least certain parts of it. Yeah, dude, Louisiana yeah. is supposed to be like the number one state for slavery still. 
Like it still has the most slavery of any state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, like when we pulled into the the second house, the big mansion, like there was this old black guy out there that was like valeting cars for people. And uh, inside, it was all beautiful white people, good solidarian stock. But yeah, outside and in the kitchen, that's that's where the black people were exclusively. They have all that leftover wealth. Nothing happened to all that wealth that was created by the slaves. It's just kind of chilling in those plantations down there and these families, dude. <laughs> For real, dude. I'd never seen anything like that in my life. Like, I've seen big, nice houses up here. But the big, nice houses up here, they're very cookie cutter. There's no craftsmanship that goes into them. Whereas, like, down there, like, oh, the the, the wood carvings on, like, that's, it's not just something that was bought at Lowe's. Somebody made that. Somebody handmade that. And that cost tens of thousands. Like, in this room, the crown molding was tens of thousands of dollars. You know, in this room over here... The dude had like fucking paintings of like Napoleonic people, like guys with, you know, like the Napoleonic military attire holding swords aloft on his wall. It was like that type of shit. Well, dude, all the all the like rich fucking white people in Haiti left Haiti after the revolution and went to New Orleans and shit. That's where they went. Yeah, they went to this doctor's house. Yes. They were they were serving. <laughs> they were, they were valeting cars. At this that would have been house. me, dude. I would have been talking to that old woman. Have you heard of the Haitian Revolution? I'm pretty sick. <laughs> There's this yeah. guy named Toussaint Louverture. Have you heard of him? Yeah. I, just at the very least, you know, just steal some silverware. Just steal. Just take it home with you. I'm not gonna say shit. I'll help you do it. Yeah. <laughs> I'll watch. It. I'm gonna. I'm gonna keep my eye. Out. I'm gonna watch for you. I'm gonna give you the go ahead. Fuck these people. Give me the uh, <laughs> the guard rotation, like Metal Gear Solid style. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna be heading back to Kentucky here in a day or so. I'll, I'll fucking hit them hard and then be on my way. Man, what would Che Guevara had done in your situation? Probably had some of that fucking high dollar whiskey and cigars, I imagine. Did he at least work? Like whoever's plantation owned it, whoever owned it, did he work? He he's a doc. I don't I don't, I don't know really of what, but he's we he's introduced as Doctor Gene. Chiropractic medicine. Maybe. I think he's like an actual medical doctor, but he was a weird dude. He had like this I think it was a toupee of Jerry Curls. He was a real old man, very slight. Just, yeah, short, skinny as could be. He had, like, this Jerry Curl toupee. And he had, you know, it was very eccentric. You could tell that. Like, the, his his dress. and But I, I've met doctors in the past. I, I don't know what the going rate for a, a, a normal doctor is in rural Louisiana. But, like, I know doctors up here that don't have that kind of, don't have anything close to that kind of wealth. So, you know, these are, like, doctors that practice in Louisville, which is, you know, Fairly decent sized city. Well, he's probably been listening to the Freakonomics <clears throat> podcast and he's really good with money, Tony. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I should have talked to him about it. Set him down. What do you think about Bitcoin, old man? <laughs> Would you like to buy some NFTs? <laughs> there you go. I would have tried to make some money off of his old fucking ass. For sure. Listen, listen. I know you've been hearing about this shit. I am the guy to talk to. <laughs> a, a, a small upfront investment of $100,000. You're going to be on the ground floor. I know the basics of what we're going to talk about tonight, but I don't know any of the details. So this should be enlightening. Tis the season, Halloween coming up, and as usual, we got we got all the scare stories starting. Oh no! Yeah. We obviously better watch out. That looks like say. definitely looks like candy, but it's not candy. These are actually brightly covered fentanyl pills, and in Holla could be deadly. It's crazy. Dirty 30s, baby. Look like Skittles. I will say kids, if they didn't know any better, they would definitely think that it's candy and that would become a problem. This is exactly what parents are worried about with Halloween right around the corner. Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my uh, so goodness. this has been going around on, on Facebook recently. Like I'll see, I, I'm not on Facebook, but people post it on the Reddit. You know, all the all the concerned parents are out there uh, warning one another that, you know, the Mexicans are making fentanyl pills that look like Skittles. In actuality, they 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 got these presses. They make them look like the old Roxy 30s. And I guess they just started messing with different colors for them. But yeah, apparently your kids are going to uh, die from fentanyl this Halloween unless you grossly overparent them. I've known one or two drug dealers in my day. And I don't know of any who would give out drugs for free to underage children. It seems like a bad idea on many on many levels. It, it doesn't make a whole lot of business sense to begin with. 
as it turns out, drugs are also kind of expensive. And in particular, opiate users are not in the habit of sharing or <laughs> giving away their their precious opiates. Like, I don't know, I, I might give some kids some uh, some weed gummies just for the lulls. But uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I had some fucking fentanyl pills. Hell no, I, I'm not sharing them. Uh, they, they've been doing this for years. I remember this crap back when I was a kid. You know, there's razor blades in the apples and they're putting poison in the in the Jolly Ranchers and shit like that. It's just it's always something. And, and it, I don't think it well, it maybe happened like one time. I think the story with the razor blade or needles or something like that, somebody that knew the family. And so they did that to their kids like on purpose. But it, it, it wasn't like a random act where they were just handing that type of stuff out. Like it was it was intentional against this particular group of people. You're being too optimistic, Tony. You got to don't trust your neighbors. They're not your friends. You don't want your taxes going to their fucking health care for sure because they're going to poison your kids and put razor blades in their Halloween candy. I would be very upset if I had to pay to build a new gymnasium on the school for those assholes knowing what they're doing to children. Yeah. So this kind of this kind of led into this an interesting story. Uh, go ahead and click on this next one, article. This is a good idea. I'm surprised they haven't had these already. Yeah, so this is uh, Kentucky's first Narcan vending machine, also for the kids. When you get a get a little bit too much of the dirty 30s on you, you go to a vending machine and buy some Narcan-like candy. But this happened right down the road from where I live at. They uh, put up a Narcan vending machine. which In is Vine in Grove. Vine Grove, huh. yeah. Uh, it's, I guess, right on the Hardin County side. Um, uh, they had the numbers in there. It's like 5,000 people overdosed in Kentucky from opiates this past year. Um, a good portion of them were in Hardin County. And uh, so there was a, one of the healthcare facilities out there ended up going in with somebody else, with some other organization, and they paid to put this uh, vending machine up. And I, I believe it's free. I believe you could just go up there and uh, get you, uh, I think, a double dose of Narcan. And, you know, and it comes Yikes. like with all the, the box also comes with information about treatment and all that stuff like that. Yeah, that, that was my first thought, too. I was like, there's no way in hell I'd go up to that vending machine. It'd scare the <laughs> shit out of me. They're watching. They're going to they're gonna have you put your, your address in or something. Put in your, your social security number to get the Narcan. You stick your hand in the machine and just handcuffs go on it. <laughs> <laughs> if you do read the article, like what they're saying is very sensible. The There's some quotes from the local police chief and the Hardin County prosecutors saying like, we're not going to arrest our way out of this situation. I don't know if, if they're going to change any, if they're actually going to change anything or start recommending treatment as opposed to giving them as, I don't know, at least they're, they're making the right noises. The day after the election, the machine gets removed. That's my bet. November 3rd, they pull it. If I was a capitalist and I was running Vine Grove, if I was running Hardin County, I'd, I'd put the heroin machine right next to the Narcan machine and just fucking rack up the dollars, baby. That's what I was thinking. So I haven't used opiates, certainly not like street opiates like this in a very, very long time. Uh, but I did have somebody a couple years ago that had some of those, I, I'm pretty sure that they were the pressed 30s that offered me some. And I, I turned it down because I was like, ah, you know, I don't, I don't know what's in this. And my anxiety so high, I'll start having a panic attack the second I touch it because I think I'm getting a contact high or whatever. But now that there's a Narcan vending machine, I probably going to go on a heroin bender really yeah like i don't have anything to lose real you know what's the worst that could happen yeah i'll just keep scott nearby like hey man if i stop breathing just stab me in the heart if you have a sketchy looking sack you know and you want to cook it up and shoot it just do it right by the vending machine just in case that way if you start yeah. to feel a little feel kick it on to a little bit too strong yeah just pop it out narcan me up and then go through the horrible precipitated there's no draws. way it's free dude so if you're not in a major city you can't just get narcan for free usually Okay, it's it's free. You go oh. up, hit the number, and you get a two-dose box and also literature that goes along with it about treatment and recovery. This is Mattingly, who is the chief of police, Vine Grove Police Chief. Good. That's awesome, man. I wonder if the city council must have done this. I'm sure the cops weren't behind this. <laughs> no. no fucking way, dude. Okay, yeah, so 22, it's 2,200 Kentuckians died of a drug overdose last year, 46 in Hardin County. Yeah, Vine Grove, it's been in the news quite a bit lately. I, I don't know. I think they're uh, they're getting hit pretty hard out there. There's been like several murders that have happened out there. Yeah, a lot of a lot of drug overdoses. I don't doubt it, dude. But anyways, a little bit of positive news. Um, get the thumbs up on that. Prioritizing safety for the drug users and treating them like people instead of scum that need to be locked up and beaten and have their dogs shot. I'm pro cop now. That really changed me. 
Thanks, Tony. Yeah, Thanks all- for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right along here. What else we got? Wild set- speculation is in order. You want to set this up or just play it? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, just play it. Bubbles caused by a mega underwater gas leak. Filmed by the Danish military, the gas is escaping from three points on Russia's Nord Stream pipelines. The mysterious damage seemingly happening just hours apart. The result of a freak coincidence? The Polish Prime Minister doesn't think so. So that uh, lets us know at least what happened. Yeah, last week there was, it uh, looks like just an accident. Um, oh, probably yeah. Somebody fishing, maybe their their <laughs> fishing line, like the hook. I think that's probably what happened. The hook caught on the pipeline and, uh, you know, and it just popped it. My guess is the sharks attacked it to, because they know that <laughs> we're, we're killing their environment. <laughs> <Is that? laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. Maybe the sharks have become radi- radicalized. Yeah. Uh, you know, they don't like the portrayal in U.S. media of sharks, you know, Jaws. Sharknado, <laughs> other stuff, and you know the sharks have gone woke. Uh, somebody has sabotaged the Nord Stream One and Nord Stream Two pipelines. There are like two pipelines for each Nord Stream. So Nord Stream One has two pipelines. Nord Stream Two has two pipelines, and both of the Nord Stream One pipelines have been damaged. And one, maybe the other. Nord Stream 2 pipeline has been damaged. There was another leak that they just found, I guess, a couple days after. Um, and I, I think maybe they're not sure if it's the other pipeline or if it's just another spot in the first Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Uh, but yeah, this is the pipeline that transports natural gas from Russia to the heart of Europe. Uh, this has already been the subject of some controversy. The Nord Stream 1 pipeline had been uh, moving natural gas for some time. The Nord Stream 2 had just got up or it was almost fully up and running. And of course, the Ukraine invasion happened and now all that kind of got thrown out the window. They, I think Russia had canceled their plans to finish it like two days before the invasion. And Europe is attempting to transition away from uh, using Russian gas. Yeah, Nord Stream 2 wasn't running. Nord Stream 1 was was finished, but it was it wasn't moving gas because it was under sanctions. But there's still like there was a lot of gas obviously in the pipeline. So that's what we're seeing come out right now. The, the West was blaming Russia for the attack. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, according to, it was about 500 million cubic meters of gas lost so far. Uh incidentally, um apparently this is not the ecological disaster that I guess a an oil pipeline would be, being that it's gas. I'm sure all the fish in that vicinity are, are going to die, but it's not going to like screw up that entire region like it like the Gulf did with the the BP spill in the Gulf of Mexico some years ago. But it is a lot of carbon dioxide. It's the equivalent of about eight million tons of carbon dioxide are going to be released into the atmosphere as a result of this. It's not good. Yeah, the uh, seismologists are are estimating that the the explosion had the the magnitude of about 100 kilograms of TNT in both incidents. So I guess each one was about 100 kilograms. But tell us who did it, Tony. Get to the good stuff here. Well, that's what we're going to have to figure out, as I am not sure. I've I mean, this is just it's really ripe for speculation, right? It could be a non-state actor. We could have some like who? uh, I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> non-state actor <laughs> i guess i don't know maybe some like some pissed off chechens or bp could have done it to try to uh some like uh <laughs> i well, you know this is so this is right off of denmark and there are a lot of excellent psychedelics made in that area so it could be some psychedelic warriors that are fighting back against climate change and <laughs> just got all hyped up from one of those lsd and mdma labs right there and uh shout out to those mdma MDMA labs got all hyped up and, and wanted to go out there and uh, manifest the change they wanted to see in the world. Yeah, it could be some really, really dumb eco-terrorists. <laughs> <laughs> could be, really. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't read much into the speculation. I mean, I know it's kind of a bound right now. You know, Russia's blaming either the U.S. or Europe. People saying that it could have been Russia, possibly Ukraine. Does Ukraine have subs? Maybe they do. I don't know. I mean, I, well, I don't think you would need a sub. You know, people were saying that this could be, you know, munitions dropped from a boat. It could be munitions dropped even from a plane. I don't think so, dude. Well, you like a depth charge, right? Yeah, but people would notice. Why would Ukraine? No, that's not going to affect Russia, really. It'll affect their pocketbook down the line. 
It has to be the West, dude. It has to be the United States. This is shit that we do, dude. This is fucking capitalist terrorism. Why Russia obviously couldn't have done this. Russia, there's no way. This makes no sense. Unless the, unless Russia was going to drop nukes the day after, it doesn't make any sense. Is it not conceivable that Russia would do this as a false flag? For what, though? To, yes, but for what? To, to rally support from the people in Russia that are already really upset about this partial mobilization. You've got... People going into recruitment centers and shooting people. You have to galvanize the great Ruski people against the Western aggressors that are supporting those Nazis in Ukraine and now bombing our pipelines and wreaking all sorts of havoc. It just doesn't make sense. Hmm. That's not how you garner public support. You garner public support by orchestrating a false flag on civilians, uh, Russian civilians, not on a state property that they don't care about. They're probably happy that it fucking isn't going to destroy the environment even worse down the line sometime. It doesn't. Yeah, it just it's not it's not a logical false flag from that point of view. It could have been. Uh, I hadn't even considered Ukraine as an option, but I guess they could have done it or Ukraine with Western support, maybe or like German support. I'm under the assumption that probably in not too long, we're going to figure out who this was or have a very good idea of who it was. I don't think so. You don't think so? I, I don't know. This. Pure speculation. I can't imagine that we don't figure out who who did it or have a pretty good idea of who did it in relatively short order. If Ukraine did this, it has the complete, in my mind, the complete opposite effect of, of what they're basically what they're fighting the war on right now, which is the support of the world. You know, if it come out that they're committing these I mean, essentially acts of terrorism on what was Dutch territorial waters, like they're losing all support from Europe. They're going to lose a lot of support from the U.S. Uh, you know, their cause, the international cause that they've they've cobbled together just kind of falls apart, uh, falls flat on its face at that point. You have to realize Ukraine is not doing anything right now without the full support of NATO. They're not doing anything right now that the U.S. doesn't know about. We're funding their entire defense right now. They, they're not doing. They're not doing yeah. this shit. They're not bombing the Putin's uh, best friend's daughter's car that just happened a couple weeks ago. They're not doing that without our help and knowledge. The attacks on the Russian uh, like ammo depots are done with U.S. intelligence telling them where the shit is. They don't. They don't have the capabilities without us helping them to do any of this shit. So that scenario that you're talking about isn't going to happen because they're not doing this type of shit without us helping them and knowing about it. And th I'm sure Zelensky's asking before he would even attempt anything like this. That's my opinion. Yeah. So for the the military targets that they're they're going after in Ukraine, obviously they're using U.S. intelligence. They're using our drones and spy satellite reconnaissance to to locate all this stuff. Uh, I'm assuming these pipelines. Like, I imagine that everybody knows where they are. Yeah. Uh, so you wouldn't need to have any state intelligence to be able to figure out where to go to to plant bombs on them. But yeah, then a question comes about you. You have to have some sort of boat to get out there if that's how it was done. If it was, you know, it would be mon somebody would have picked it up. I mean, there's radar monitoring. It's a it's a major seaway. All, all the nations around there, the Scandinavian countries, Germany, everybody's going to have radar. They're going to be monitoring that that strait and seeing who goes through there. And you know, even if you didn't have like a transponder on your ship, you know, somebody's going to pick it up. Somebody's going to see something. So. My mom, she astutely pointed out something she had seen sometime back on Facebook that I believe is going to answer this, this question we have. According to Wikipedia here, Ukraine has 27 combat ships total. Combat ships and cutters that were former, former Soviet ships. And they've received five small Willard Marine Patrol boats uh, since then. So that's their Navy. A bunch of old-ass Soviet ships. You wouldn't even need. I don't think you'd even need a combat ship. I mean, you could get like a just like a, a whaler or some. I don't know some some big fishing vessel, right? Like they would have the technology to be able to scan the sea floor. Yeah, I guess you're right. Like a, like a, like a crab boat, you know, the Bering Sea crab fishermen dudes. They got the ability to scan. You know, you know roughly where it's at. Scan the sea floor. You say, okay, this is where the pipeline is. You got a, a crane just to drop your your depth charge off the back. And yeah, I guess just the ease with which it could be done. I mean, it, it really does kind of open it up for anybody. I mean, it could be a major state actor. Ninety nine percent is the U S. Dude, we might find out about it in like fifty years when it's declassified and it's one hundred twenty degrees in Kentucky. Okay. All right. Well, here we're gonna we're gonna watch a little clip real quick. If Russia invades, uh, that means. Tanks and troops crossing the, uh, the, the border of Ukraine again. Then uh, there will be uh, we, there will be no longer the Nord Stream two. We we will bring an end to it. Ooh. Hold on, play that again. I haven't heard this. Ooh, what is this from? Do you know? I don't know. We'll find out. Uh, that means tanks and troops crossing the 
uh, the, the, I guess this was just prior to the invasion. Again, then uh, there will be uh, we, there will be no longer the Nord Stream two. We, we will bring an end to it. Okay. But how will you how will you do that exactly? Since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control, we will. Uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it if Russia invades. Uh, Oh, yeah, I, I promise you. I guess did you hear it all? Of course. I mean, that has to it has to be the U.S. Right? <laughs> That's pretty clear. <laughs> I don't know, man. That seems really brazen. I I would be incredibly surprised if the U.S. did that. What are they accomplishing by blowing up the pipeline that they haven't either already accomplished through diplomacy with the European nations or couldn't potentially accomplish through diplomacy with the European nations? They're destroying all the natural gas that's in the pipeline. Because Russia turned it off, I'm sure, on their end. But there's still hundreds of thousands of tons. I don't know how much is in there. But it's all. It's just a fuck you to Putin. It's just more capitalist sabotage and warfare. This is their strategy. This is modern warfare. This is how the U.S. operates now. They 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 impoverish their enemies. Yeah. So it's a total of 500 million cubic meters of gas was lost. It sounds like a lot. I don't know, but <laughs> it sounds like a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Our kids are fucked. But unless the U.S. made damn sure that nobody finds out about it i mean which i guess we we've, we've got the capability to, to if anybody has the capability to, to do that in complete secrecy it would be the u.s well it's not but, really a secret i mean everybody kind of knows it was us don't they it's not i mean i really don't know i my initial thought to that to to the idea that the u.s did it was like surely not surely we didn't do that because if it come out if it absolutely like we know uh they find the the, the how would anybody ever know Somebody seen the ship. Somebody has some concrete proof. Their, their military technology picked up this particular make of ship and followed it back to X place where they could verify that it was the U.S. The U.S. doesn't have like one or two ships out there. We have hundreds of ships all over the world at all times in every part of the, the U.S. Navy is gigantic and it's fucking everywhere. We have aircraft carriers off the coast of every country, basically. We have military, we have naval bases in every NATO country, multiple NATO bases in every NATO country. It sounds like you might know something about this. And I know you were in the Navy. <laughs> they do keep me updated. <laughs> what, <laughs> what were you all doing? Yeah, the Harry S. Truman is out there right now. And, and to be fair, like it could be, it could have been a plane. It could have been a missile dropped from very high altitude. Either I guess, I mean, I guess it could have been fired or it could have just been. Uh, I don't think you could drop it from an aircraft. It would explode on impact with the water. Oh, I've, they've got shit worked out. They could. Yeah, you're probably right. I mean, they probably could shot yeah. it with a fucking laser beam from the moon. Most likely. <laughs> <laughs> You were getting a lot of money from Russia. They were paying you a lot of money, and they probably still are. But now, with what came out today, it's even worse. All of the emails, the emails, the horrible emails of the kind of money that you were raking in, you and your family. And Joe, you were vice president when some of this was happening, and it should have never happened. And I think you owe an explanation to the American people. Why is it? Somebody just had a news conference a little while ago who was essentially supposed to work with you and your family. But what he said was damning. And regardless of me, I think you have to clean it up and talk to the American people. Maybe you can do it right now. There we go. Spitting some truth at old Joe Biden there. Um, you, this clip was the debate, right, between Trump and Biden 2016. 2020. This is the 2020 debate. This is the third debate. And what he's referring to is the this was when the Hunter Biden laptop was discovered. All the emails, with the, the corruption contained within this all got leaked out to the world. And uh, it has been a frequent refrain of the right ever since. Um, you know, all the, the scandals that have emerged from the knowledge that we gained from the emails. And uh, I thought it might be worthwhile to actually go through and separate the wheat from the chaff and, and figure out what was actually in there, if there's any truth to it, any substance to any of it, or if it's just uh, right wing crybabying. Hunter, like, took his laptop into the repair shop to get it worked on and just forgot about it and just bought yeah. a new one, I guess. He just said, fuck it. <laughs> I don't know what I do with that damn laptop. <laughs> um, I'm yeah. assuming there was some pretty incriminating stuff on this laptop because the Republicans are constantly bringing this up as a reason to in impeach Biden and mm -hmm. or arrest Hunter slash Biden. I, I don't know. Must be some pretty bad shit, though. Oh, it, it certainly is. So, yeah, this is a. Uh during the 2020 election, uh, these rumors come about about Hunter Biden's alleged corruption. 
course, Hunter's decades long weird situations, you know, like banging his dead brother's wife and cashing in on his dad's reputation uh, had fueled the idea that there was something weird going on. That there was some corruption, some malfeasance that, that needed to be looked into. So in the closing weeks of the 2020 election, Trump loyalists began pushing for the October surprise to turn around the tide of the election in Trump's favor. Now, what we got from the email scandal were this uh, series of kind of salacious stories about Hunter's alleged illicit involvement with foreign governments and his functioning as a go-between for his father and these shadowy foreign actors. Like you were saying, yeah, the story starts from Hunter Biden having taken his laptop to a repair shop in 2019. Apparently, he never went to pick it up. And even this story is like, it's just really weird. I don't know if you know, like the actual story of how he lost it and who the guy was at the computer repair shop that found it. He's a buddy of Mike Lindell's, probably. <laughs> yeah. uh, close, really close. Yeah, so apparently he never went to pick it up and the repair shop owner let it be known that he had the laptop. He he put out the bat signal to the uh, Republican operatives that, that he had in his possession Hunter Biden's laptop and that he had made copies of an external hard drive that apparently was with the laptop. Oh, shit, that's a fucking million dollar lottery. That's a hundred million dollar lottery ticket, baby. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. Oh, man. He, yeah, he had to got paid, surely. Rudy uh, Giuliani so yeah. wound up with the laptop at the end of the story. So <laughs> I guarantee you got paid, dude. Uh, yeah. So October 2020 was the first set of articles written by authors at the New York Post release. It's important to note at this point that though Hunter did acknowledge that it was likely his laptop, because initially they were saying it wasn't his laptop or he was saying it was not his laptop. He ended up acknowledging that it, it was his laptop and that some of the emails and pictures contained within were his. The laptop does have a very uncertain provenance, um, so not all of the info it contains can be verified. And it is very possible, if not likely, that at least some parts of it do contain Russian disinformation. Um, because this got passed around to a lot of different hands and there was a lot of different individuals that had access to these to the laptop and the multiple copies of the hard drive prior to it getting released to the uh, media outlets that ended up publishing the emails. The owner of the repair shop was this guy named Mac Isaac. He was legally blind. Uh, odd character to to work on a computer um so he could actually not identify the person that brought the laptop to him whether it was hunter or whether it was just somebody else that was saying they were hunter this is just a weird little quirk of the story the whole thing's really odd how do you repair a laptop if you can't read or like i don't know see what's <laughs> on the screen <laughs> i don't know Interesting. uh maybe Maybe he's just the owner, um, but there's nobody else listed as ever having access to it at the repair shop other than Mac Isaac. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, maybe you could see a little bit. He's just like legally blind. Okay. Uh, uh, he did, however, refer to Giuliani as his lifeguard and an apparent reference to this conspiracy. This is Mac Isaac, an apparent reference to this conspiracy theory that in 2016, the Hillary Clinton campaign was responsible for killing this campaign worker, Seth Rich, the man that had claimed responsibility for leaking the DNC emails. When he goes to put the stuff out, um, yeah, he puts out the bat signal to the Republican intelligentsia like Rudy Giuliani, and he was quickly good friends with him and referred to him as uh, his friend, his lifeguard. He was a pretty dyed in the war right winger. And he had to be. I, I think he, he knew where his bread was going to be buttered. Because if he had told Hunter or I mean, if he had told Joe Biden's campaign, hey, I got Hunter's laptop, they would have paid him as much as anybody oh, else would have. Of course. Of course. Whatever Trump was offering, you know, surely the Biden campaign would be offering the same amount. So, yeah. Some background on Hunter. He had spent decades working as a lawyer around Washington, D.C. Uh, George Bush appointed him to the board of directors of Amtrak in 2006. He acted as a lobbyist and lawyer also during this time and up through his tenure with Burisma Holdings, which began in 2014. Now, many have pointed out that it's odd that Hunter Biden would be randomly hired to a Ukrainian oil and gas firm since he knows nothing about oil and gas. Now, I don't think obviously, it's that like, odd. Yeah, well, he, yeah, he, he's not giving advice on refining. He was hired to conduct general corporate counseling. Essentially, he was just a lobbyist on their behalf. Influence peddling. Influence peddling, indeed. And this was during the Obama presidency uh, where Joe Biden was the point person uh, on Ukraine policy, which is likely why Hunter was offered the position. Uh, it certainly reeks of Ukraine attempting to curry favor and buy special treatment. <clears throat> this is like really par for the course for Washington politics. Uh, I couldn't find a citation for it, but apparently at the time, the Obama administration was uncomfortable about the relationship 
And realistically, something should have been done about it, whether Joe be removed from the Ukraine policy uh, or some sort of oversight board established to, to examine the dealings. But it, it was recognized as shady at the time when Joe's dealing with Ukraine and his son gets hired on at $50,000 a month to advise on the board of this company. Those were back in the olden days when people had to pretend like there was no cronyism going on. Nowadays, they, it wouldn't matter, I don't think. No. So Burisma was this, I guess it was state-run Ukrainian um, holding company? Yeah. Interesting. What the fuck? Hang on. I'm gonna... Biden was working for a natural gas company in Ukraine, and Shokin was investigating its owner. But the U.S. and several Western allies did not think Shokin was doing enough to clean up corruption in Ukraine. So then Vice President Biden went to Ukraine. He threatened to withhold U.S. aid a billion dollars worth if Shokin was not fired because the United States didn't want to give money to a country that would be squandered by a corrupt government. Now, Shokin was fired. President Trump claims Vice President Biden's ultimatum there is the real crime here, but there's no evidence of that. Okay, so we're starting to meet some of the main characters in the initial scandal that come out as a result of these emails. Shokin is a lawyer. Who is Shokin working for? So I'm going to get into it right now. So the allegations are that when Viktor Shokin, who is a prosecutor in Ukraine, began investigating Burisma and their alleged corruption, Burisma lobbied Joe and the Obama administration through Hunter to push Shokin out. Now, it's further alleged that Joe Biden at this time threatened to withhold guaranteed loans to Ukraine until this prosecutor was removed from office, which is what they were just talking about there. This, these are the allegations that Trump was making. So the truth is a little different. Shokin's removal was demanded by a number of different international organizations at that time. The EU, the World Bank, the IMF, large parts of the European Union were all kind of trying to get this one to go. There's a bunch of guys in, in Ukraine at the time, but we're trying to get him and other remnants of the pre-Maidan revolution government, the Russian-backed old system. They're trying to push them out before they started giving money to kind of rebuild Ukraine in the more Euro-centered government that, that they were hoping to set up with them. Interesting. Uh, yeah, so... Uh, that seems very sus yeah. to me. I don't know about that. So, yeah, why did they want him removed? So... He was a Russian stooge, or this is the allegation. He refused to prosecute corrupt business dealings, specifically when the corruption was linked to Russian oligarchs. He also refused to prosecute the sniper attacks from just a couple years prior during the Maidan revolution. So this is kind of the essence of what this issue is really about. You know, Ukraine, yeah, just had this revolution, was trying to align themselves with Europe and away from Russia. Ukraine had historically been deeply steeped in Russian oligarch corruption. And as they began to try to integrate with the West and with Europe, they had certain demands placed on them because they were asking for a lot of money and, and help rebuilding and resetting up their government at the time. So they needed to clean up their country before these powerful Western entities like the U.S., World Bank, etc. would give them loans. Shokin was incredibly unpopular in Ukraine at the time and had even had some assassination attempts against him that he had survived. This sounds, oh my God, this, sounds, this guy sounds like a fucking CIA op. <laughs> Straight up. Who's Shokin? Shokin seems like a, a Russian asset, obviously, but like mm -hmm. the attempts to take him out because why can't we have somebody in there to prosecute the Western oligarchs? Because there's still oligarchs there. I mean, the running fucking Russia. There's like one guy that owns like 70% of the land in Korea. It's crazy. Yeah, well, obviously, you, you know this as well as I. The issue wasn't with oligarchs. The issue was with Russian, Russian oligarchs. oligarchs. Yeah. Uh, our oligarchs are, are just fine. And prosecute the snipers? They didn't know who the fucking snipers were. There were some rumors, but there was no evidence. Were they just going to prosecute some Russians because just to fuck Russia? Gosh. Yeah, that's how you do. Ukraine you is crazy, up. dude. Especially pre-invasion. <laughs> Ukraine was nuts. It was like the uh, arms deal capital of the world. <laughs> I'll allow that, but don't you dare speak ill of Zelensky. Of course not. I will not stand for it. <laughs> Zelensky's a savage. Let's be honest. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, hopefully this uh, starts to give a little credence to the claim that much of the story was Russian disinformation or the framing of the story that was being put out by Giuliani and the Trump campaign was a Russian framing that this Shokin guy was a honest prosecutor that was actually looking into corruption from these different Western Eurocentric, US centric entities, and that he was pushed out illegally, unnecessarily for the political gain of the Biden family of the US. 
So this is where some of the allegations of the Russian framing and Russian disinformation start coming from. Uh Yeah. Instead of Shokin being a fearless and principled prosecutor going after the corruption of Burisma and being attacked for it, he was a Russian stooge that was highly corrupt and had internal and external forces trying to push him out. So the purported impropriety comes from the withholding of loan funds over Shokin's investigation of Burisma corruption connected to the Biden family. Now, the truth is, at the time that Victor Pashoka, who is Victor Shokin's predecessor, was investigating the previous owner and co-founder of Burisma for various financial crimes. All of these financial crimes occurred a couple years prior to Hunter Biden being brought on. So there was an investigation. It was a legitimate investigation. There had been a lot of corruption going on through this Burisma, but the selective prosecution, it seems like, was pretty just, it was just all just politically motivated, which is exactly what you would expect in Ukraine, especially during that time period. You know, it's just, they're pushing out, it is a power struggle between Russian oligarchs and, and the new Eurocentric oligarchs, like we just talked about. The owner that brought on Hunter ended up fleeing Ukraine at the end of 2014. Uh, this entire period was really tied to the Maidan Revolution. The owner of Burisma fled? The owner of Burisma fled. So tw- the beginning of 2014 was the Maidan Revolution. At the end of 2014, he had fled at that point. This is while he was under investigation for the financial crimes from a couple years earlier. This is fascinating. Yeah. So it was at this point in time, it was post made on revolution that Joe Biden was appointed by Obama to be the point man on Ukraine. He was the one that was going to help them get everything turned around and realigned with Europe. Even the investigations at the time that were happening, there was no investigations involving Hunter. He was brought on to basically be a lobbyist for this shady ass Ukrainian oil company, the owner of which had almost certainly done some financial crimes. But uh, yeah, the investigation, even from Shokin, the, 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 it did not involve Hunter Biden in any way. They were just, it was all about the owner. So I don't, yeah. What's your initial feelings about this, James? You know, it's, it's really hard to say what Hunter's real role was. I think you and I probably have a good uh, inkling as to what it was, but the fact that he was hired two months after his dad was appointed to oversee relations is a little odd. <laughs> it, it's, it's better than having to fly over there a bunch of times. Just send your fucking fail son over there to peddle in your influence. Plus he's, it'll keep him out of trouble. They don't have crack in Ukraine, do they? Uh, I think it's just crocodile. Oh, just crocodile. Yeah, he'll be fine, dude. Yeah, yeah. All right, hang on now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of audio listeners, Tony has put on a tinfoil hat, a literal tinfoil hat. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter made this for me. All right, so now we're going full uh, tinfoil time. Was Hunter sent to Ukraine by his dad to cash in on the post made on Ukraine? So essentially, you have a scenario that's kind of like a micro of the fall of the Soviet Union, this mm-hmm. complete reorganization of the economic power structures. Old Russian style ol- oligarchs were being pushed out. New Western aligned oligarchs were coming in. Per Reuters, at this time, the IMF also wanted Shokin to be removed from his position along with the U.S. After the 2020 election, IMF Managing Director Kristalina Georgieva sent personal letters to President-elect Biden and running mate Kamala Harris and would not provide context about the contents. That is so weird. Why? What the fuck would the IMF care about a prosecutor in Ukraine looking into a holding company? Uh, So the IMF was very interested in making sure that Shokin was out. Now, per Reuters, much of the IMF's long-term goals revolve around, and per the IMF's own website, much of the IMF's long-term goals revolve around funding green energy initiatives in third world and developing countries. And having the U.S. re-enter the Paris Agreement would certainly go a long way to providing steam and funding for the IMF. Along with Trump denying additional new resources to the IMF, was the IMF supporting the Biden-backed usurpation of Ukrainian industry in exchange for their support in implementing a global Green New Deal. <laughs> so the IMF is interested in this prosecutor. The, the IMF wanted the prosecutor pushed out. The IMF was also in contact with Kamala Harris and Joe Biden. Sure. The IMF was also upset, did not want to deal with the Trump administration because he had pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement Right. And the IMF is wanting to, their their stated goal is to provide funding and to, to kind of develop themselves pushing these green energy initiatives. So now you have this 
energy company, Burisma, that they get involved in, and they're going to support Biden in his role with this business company to back the usurpation to get their feet in the door for the Ukrainian energy industry so that they can bring on a global Green New Deal. Gosh, golly, that is awesome. It's going deep. It's that going deep. Awesome. I wish this was true, man. This would be a much better world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if the IMF was uh, supporting CIA efforts in fucking Ukraine in order to promote green energy policy. <laughs> yeah. That'd be amazing, dude. I'd be uh, I'd be on, on board the Western train. I'd be like, hell yeah, globalize this shit, buddy. Okay, well. Overthrow Putin. Overthrow Putin. And then uh, maybe AOC ends up becoming the new president. Yeah. You know, Biden's just setting the way, getting the Green New Deal up and going. And I mean, really, it's probably AOC and Nancy Pelosi behind all this anyways. Chomsky's been talking shit about the IMF all these decades. And really, he's, he's in the wrong here. IMF is a force for good in the world. They are. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> That was the first scandal. This is the that's the Burisma scandal. All that come out of the emails. Now we're going to move on to the second scandal. Who better to the, to explain it than uh, our our dear old friend and friend of the podcast, Mike Huckabee? They're not doing it. I just can't imagine how they can ignore this story. Why they're not asking the question: Who is the big guy that Hunter Biden talked about, who's getting ten percent of the spoils? And if it isn't Joe Biden, then tell us who it is. But it's pretty obvious who it is, and it's just a, an amazing thing to me, Maria, that we have one of the biggest scandals in American history. I don't say that lightly. I don't say that with hyperbole. This is one of the greatest scandals. Uh, potentially in all of American history. So you heard it there. We've heard quite a bit about the big guy and who this shadowy figure was from the emails. So there was a second article released the following day, the day after the first article with the information contained about the Burisma dealings, uh, about a business deal in 2017 when Joe was not in government with the CEFC China Energy Group. So Hunter was apparently negotiating on behalf of this Chinese company and potential investment partners. Again, the email in question is not alleged to have actually been written by Hunter, but it was an email in which Hunter was copied. It details the proposed share distribution and ends with, quote, 10 held by H for the big guy, question mark. Now, the New York Post alleges that H referred to Hunter and a former business partner of Hunter's soon came forward asserting that the big guy was Joe Biden. Now, Hunter responds in a subsequent email that the chairman gave an emphatic no. A later email identifies the chairman as Joe Biden. So, yeah, this this is really it. This is <laughs> this is the one that had a lot of hay made about it. The whole big guy thing. It sounds the coolest. 10 held by H for the big guy. Obviously, $10 million or 10... 10%, maybe. 10 million or 10%. Or 10 child sex slaves. Could be. Possible. Yeah. I, I didn't think of that. Yeah. Most likely. <laughs> held by H. So that's Hunter, obviously. Nobody else has an H. And Hunter does have a, a room for holding child sex slaves. Yeah. We did find that out in the emails. This is the, the one that I thought was going to be the most interesting, and it turned out to be kind of the least interesting. So this was like, not it was not even an email that Hunter wrote. It was just some dude that wrote in, that sent Hunter this this email. And uh, Who was the dude? Was it anybody? It was one of Hunter's business partners. I believe this was Tony Boblinski. And held by H for the big guy. Well, that's the guy talking. That's not Hunter talking. Correct. It is the other guy. What the fuck, dude? <laughs> this is so stupid. And I, yeah, I don't know if you did catch it, but obviously Mike Huckabee, uh, everybody else on Fox News, Mike Huckabee specifically said that why is Hunter talking? Like, why is Hunter saying this? And it was not Hunter, but this was the story that was going around is that this was an email that Hunter had wrote. He wouldn't call um, himself H. He wouldn't use himself as an objective. Yeah, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> no wonder Rudy's like, everybody's wanting the laptop. I got the laptop right here. And nobody, everybody's like. We don't, who cares a fuck about the laptop, Giuliani? I get it now. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's actually it for the second article. That was the, the big bombshell contained there. Um, like I said, I, I never looked into this story until reading for this. And for the life of me, I really thought that there was more to it than this. You know, also the, the reply that Hunter ended up giving to this guy, which was that his dad gave an emphatic no. And that never really gets brought up. You know, I guess 
a business proposition was proposed as propositions are or want to be and joe said no emphatically it's a, kind of the end of it yeah also, when this deal was proposed, and this was by a, a Chinese company, a Chinese energy company, obviously linked to the Chinese government. Um, this is in 2017 when Joe was not in government. The email was from someone else. So the first email makes a reference to Hunter receiving a $10 million fee from a Chinese billionaire for introductions alone. Um, the second email in which Hunter was copied ends with 10 held by H for the big guy. Now, Hunter does does respond in a subsequent email that the chairman gave him an emphatic no. A later email identifies the chairman as being Joe Biden. Introductions alone. Jesus, $10 million to introduce to the Bidens? Yes. Yeah, they ain't messing around. Like I said, Hunter was copied in the email. I, I think it's just pretty apparent, and they're not denying that the H is actually Hunter. It's just a speaking fee. I mean, this is just normal cronious shit. This is normal shit that happens constantly and happened a hundred times worse under Trump. Yeah, and the, the important thing with this and the the difference that I've I've had to point out to people, there's no evidence that Biden was was partaking in any of this. You know, you've just got some little some his son, his fuck up son going around and cashing in and trying to set up these business deals based on his dad's name. And it looks like from all accounts that his dad just was not having anything to do with any of it. You know, he was giving emphatic no's. Nothing has come out that Joe was actually participating in any of these deals yeah it's it's cronyism it's kind of it doesn't smell good um but you know hunter's a private citizen he's not in government he's not abusing the power of government he's not getting tax dollars allocated i don't know i don't know what, what do you do with it it doesn't even seem like he did anything illegal it was just the fact that he's able to do this because his dad is fucking joe biden which welcome to america i mean what the fuck yeah is there a major politician's kid that does not profit off of no they'd be just stupid. at the very no, least the, yeah the name of their the name of their parent so there was a another little connection that might be a little bit sketchy okay connections but the connections really haven't been made so 2013 hunter is on air force two with his dad on a father-son field trip to beijing hunter meets up with jonathan lee a chinese investment banker hunter downplays the meeting with lee as them going out so, th so this i uh, should step back this was a story that came out as a result of the emails that was later elaborated on by people that were involved in it to give some context to what was said in the emails so yeah hunter meets up with jonathan lee this chinese investment banker hunter downplays the meeting with lee as just them going to get a cup of coffee a couple weeks after the trip a private equity fund bhr partners who lee was the chief executive of gained approval by the chinese government hunter also a board member held a 10 percent stake at that time so hunter is traveling there on air force two with his dad to meet up with this guy who is this uh, private equity fellow in china and something happened in the weeks preceding that they ended up gaining approval by the chinese government to conduct business and hunter profited massively oh well oh, hang on hang on okay here we go again the hat's back on <laughs> hat's back on all right james so was the 10 percent stake that was talked about here actually the tin that h was holding for the big guy did the ccp use the illusion of a biden deal with the big guy to lure hunter a known coattail rider into attempting a business deal the details of which would later be released as a means to curry favor with the trump administration perhaps the, on the precondition that trump stopped calling COVID the china virus <laughs> so this was all set up by the chinese to keep from getting blamed for their Wuhan release of the virus. So they honeypotted Hunter with yes. illusions of I all this it. money he could be made to get dirt on him to help sway the election in favor of Trump, to get to curry favor for Trump by doing so. This is brilliant. Yeah. And this is perfect because they knew they wanted to release this virus pretty soon, but they didn't want it to be called the China virus. They wanted a better name. They didn't want it to be linked to the Taiwan them. virus. Yeah, that'd be the <laughs> They were shipping the virus to Taiwan and it leaked on the way. It fucked up their whole plan, but they were setting the stage for a good op. As an aside here, let me just say, I don't know if you know anything about like uh Hunter and Joe's relationship, but apparently like 
Joe Biden is really fucking nice. And there was some like text messages leaked between Hunter and Joe. I don't know how this happened, but um, it just paints the two of them like in a good light. Yeah, he's just acting like just a really loving dad. Telling me, I love you, son. And, you know, Hunter's uh, like, I'm sorry I fucked up again. He's like calling him from rehab. And Joe Biden's <laughs> like, it's OK. I love you. This type of stuff. Yeah, it's just it's really heartwarming, actually. Speaking of which. All right. So we'll move on to some more salacious details. Ooh, graphic. Im- oh, no. What are we going to watch here? Oh, no. It's not too graphic. Oh, this is the um, the tank. <laughs> Smoking crack in a float tank. <laughs> Get it, buddy. I mean, that's pretty baller. Look at them eyes. I've been there. <laughs> and he's drinking a fucking White Claw. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? What a baller. <laughs> this is a... <laughs> He's on his phone. That's awesome. You know why? This is great. <laughs> yeah. Why is he recording it? And he jerks off in there too, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't get to watch that. Man, that's some shit I would do just to get away from everybody. Nice and peaceful in there. When you're rich, Jeez. I mean, you're not going to be smoking crack behind a fucking dumpster. You're going to be smoking crack in the float tank, man. And the fucking float tank with some like big baller ass bracelets on. Yeah. And a white claw, apparently. I I'm 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 probably would have went for something a little bit better. but How do you sneak all this shit in there? Because he's naked when you go in, aren't you? I guess they just leave the room. You were uh, Hunter Biden, they just leave the room, yeah. Yeah, they don't give a shit. That's pretty epic. I consider this to be one of the one of the bigger scandals that come out of this. Really? In the email, in the laptop, this was not actually part of the emails, but when the laptop was released, there was all these videos of Hunter engaging in extracurriculars with some lovely young ladies and some lovely chemicals. Obviously, we just watched one of smoking crack and white claws and a float tank, which Sounds like a fucking amazing time, honestly. What do you do with the nut, though? You don't want it floating around in there with you. I wouldn't give a shit. Fuck it. <laughs> There's a little bunch of salt in there. They got cleaning chemicals, whatever. <laughs> um, yeah, so what Hunter chooses to do with his money and his time is obviously of no concern to me or anyone else's. What bothered me about this was the hypocrisy with which Joe deals with his son's drug use and how he views the drug use of others is completely unjustifiable and something that requires different treatment than the way he treats his son. So remember that Joe Biden was the author of the crime bill, which put extraordinarily high sentencing requirements on people in possession of crack cocaine. Hunter is definitely smoking crack. There's nothing law enforcement can really do about a video of somebody. So I'm not saying, you know, well, he needs to be gone after and arrested for doing that. Because like, I don't think there's a prosecutor in the U.S. that would even try to go after somebody for a video if they didn't actually think they'd have something on him. I'm not a rich person. Yeah, certainly not. Yeah, you may be a poor person that, that didn't have money for a lawyer. Yeah. Certainly nobody in Hunter's position. Yeah, so Joe has repeatedly stood by his son when his addiction got the better of him and all the better for him. Uh, He's repeatedly protected him from legal prosecution and paid for treatment services. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he he extended those same privileges to all Americans? Yeah, I don't know. That's that's kind of what bothers me. It just rubs me the wrong way, just the the hypocrisy of the whole thing. That's where Joe Biden messed up. See, Hunter is rebelling against his uh, puritanical dad. Hunter is our punishment to Joe Biden for the crime bill. Yeah, this is uh, karma. Lord works in mysterious ways. God gave him Hunter as punishment for his fucked up attitude yeah well i hope uh i hope joe biden's losing some sleep at night anyways last one here tonight a cnn investigation of hunter biden's emails revealing years of high income and even higher debts more than half a million dollars in unpaid bills repeated warnings from banks the irs even threatened not to renew hunter biden's passport this as the justice department weighs possible charges against the president's son drew griffin is out front Interesting. Republicans have been demanding that Hunter be investigated for every single aspect of the emails, from the prostitute to the drugs to the 10 hell by H for the big guy. To the obviously photoshopped penis size. They're very upset about that. Can't be that big. Uh, Well, certainly not if he's been smoking crack. We know how that goes. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah, this this is the one that, that, I don't know, could potentially, like, there's, there's a there there here. Uh, So as the nice CNN lady was explaining, the emails also contained a litany of Hunter's sensitive financial documents. Hunter was a serial non-tax filer and overspender. 
Hmm. Uh, he had he had accrued a substantial amount of debt during this time period, like from 2015 to 2019, when the he lost the laptop. Well, hold on a second now. Is it debt or is it he just didn't file taxes because he's off running in the streets or whatever he's fucking doing? It's both. So he had accrued a substantial amount of debt. He had maxed out credit cards, uh-huh. had very high uh, loans that he'd taken out with different banks. He was getting overdue notices for one credit card that had a $65,000 limit. It was like maxed out and they were getting, yeah, he was getting notices. Hey, the credit card's maxed out and overdue. Wasn't returning his library books on time. What? Uh, just just being an all around awful person, really. Asshole. So he has all these private debts that he's, that he's accrued and he's constantly has uh, his accountant trying to handle these things and uh not only is hunter not following the advice at this time of his accountant to try to work on settling these debts up and make minimum payments but apparently he was also stiffing the accountant on pay (laughs) good it was also during this time period that he racked up years of delinquent tax debts now he just recently settled these for around two million dollars the first one mentioned, the first year of delinquent taxes mentioned in the emails was 2013, where it was like $60,000 that he owed. Apparently 2015, 2016, 2017, he had tax debts in the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he just was not paying. Yeah, see, he should have inflated his asset values. That way you could really shave some some money off of that tax bill, man. Yeah, I'm sure he could have bought something and you know shown some serious losses. You know, A hotel, something like that. Hey, he did his painting. I'm sure paint's not cheap. You can write all that off, I'm sure, right? Probably. So he racked up all this tax debt. He ended up settling with the IRS for around $2 million. When he did this, this was during the time period that he started selling his paintings for what people thought were slightly inflated prices, I guess we'll say. But uh, they are still, though he has settled with the IRS, they are still currently investigating him. And this is the one thing that could potentially see charges. So, you know, they, they've got off of him. He settled up his past debts. Well, they can't charge him if he settled it. That's not my understanding of, of what was going on, that he paid it up, but he could still be held liable for all the years of not paying it. Now, the one thing that he has in his favor that a certain other person doesn't have in his favor is that he wasn't trying to avoid the tax. He was just not paying yeah. them. He There was no like avoidance schemes going on. This is just a very irresponsible person that was blowing his money on on right. partying and drugs and um, just not taking care of his responsibilities. I don't know who would do something like that. That seems very unprofessional. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? So that's kind of it. That's, uh, that's what's contained in the email. And kind of going back to the beginning, this whole scheme was pushed by Steve Bannon and Rudy Giuliani from the get-go. Now, these are the guys that had talked about the laptop early on before anything was even released. Giuliani facilitated the purchase of the hard drive by the New York Post. Bannon orchestrated the release and messaging of what appeared on the laptop. Um, There's some leaked White House audio of Bannon discussing this just before the election. It was supposed to be the October surprise, or it was the October surprise, just didn't work for the intended goal of getting Trump reelected. But it did help to further vilify the Biden administration in the eyes of the, the MAGA purists and give them what they thought was an excellent counterpoint to whenever Trump and companies corruption was brought up. For example, Bannon enlisted the assistance of exiled Chinese businessman Guao Wingzhu to help distribute the more salacious photos included on the laptop. Guao set up a streaming site to distribute the videos and included instructions on how to share the videos on social media without getting them banned. Because this is pics of him doing drugs and fucking and all that good stuff. Another man Bannon refers to named Lude helped spread the word that the videos contained footage of Hunter with underage Chinese girls. Bannon referred to this as later on. Obviously, this was not true. There was no videos of him with any underage girls. Uh, Bannon was asked about this later on, and he referred to this as creative editorial control. Also known as lying. (laughs) Yeah, also known as lying. Or politics. This probably had the reverse impact that Bannon intended. I mean, you're just showing the entire public how fucking awesome Hunter Biden is. It's pretty dumb <laughs> from a political point of view. I mean, all the old fucks aren't voting for Joe Biden anyway. Yeah. I don't know. I share that evaluation that it looks like, you know, he's living the life I want to live. I mean, he's not doing that bad considering how much money. <laughs> well, I mean, he, he looks healthy, right? You know, he looks good. He's, he's not destroying himself doing it. Um, yeah. uh, you know, he's still fine. He's got plenty of money. He's not going to be, you know, resorting to eating ramen noodles and nothing like that. He's not hurting anybody. 
not hurting it, just having a good time. Yeah. Making a lot of ladies, paying a lot of girls' ways through college. So more power to them. Providing jobs, very lucrative crack selling jobs, I think are important for the economy. <laughs> Also, I guess kind of as an added note, so because as you were saying, there's there's not there wasn't a whole lot there. There wasn't really a lot of there there. This story really didn't kick off until like a couple weeks after every. I mean, there was the initial buzz about it, but what really made it take off was the social media platforms' response to it. Uh, so this is when the allegations that the algorithms were being modified to to suppress the information in there. And that really gave fire to the idea that, you know, there was this deep state cabal that was trying to suppress what was in the emails. And this is when it kind of become more legend than fact. That's kind of when I noticed it. You know, people were talking about, like the emails were available, but people were talking about what they heard was in the emails as if they were like some ancient unearthed Coptic text that wasn't really decipherable so we could never really know what was there and it was we only rely on rumor i'm interested in your opinion because i've heard a lot of leftists being including people i respect like you know chomsky burgess been really critical of social media censoring this story saying that it's basically censorship well hey let's uh i got one more little clip real quick oh okay information important misinformation we we also have this third party fact checking program because we don't want to be deciding what's true and false and for the i think it was five or seven days when it was basically being um, being determined whether it was false. Um, the distribution on Facebook was decreased, but people were still allowed to share it. So you could still share it. You could still consume it. So when um, you say the distribution is decreased, in, it, it got shared. It, how does that work? It basically the ranking in newsfeed was a little bit less. So fewer people saw it than would have otherwise. So it definitely. By what percentage? I, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's. It's it's meaningful, but I mean, but basically, a um, a lot of people were still able to share it. We got a lot of complaints that that was the case. Um, you know, obviously, this is a hyper political issue. So, depending on what side of the political spectrum you either think we didn't censor right. enough or censor he he's talking about the hunter hunter Biden emails at this point. There was that that kind of uncertainty from when it was first released as to whether or not it was Russian disinformation, and apparently the FBI contacted Mark Zuckerberg and told him. Excuse me, sir. I know you're really busy. Hate to bother you. This may be Russian disinformation, and uh, apparently they didn't tell him not to share it, but they did let him know it's likely that this is at least partially Russian disinformation. But when it was found out that Facebook was moderating the sharing and then other organizations like Twitter just kind of like shut it down altogether, yeah, it, it just it exploded the MAGA heads and they, they really, their persecution complex really started kicking in at that point. Well, you've looked into this story. Do you think it's okay that this was, for example, on Facebook is different a little bit than Twitter on Facebook. Somebody like Ben Shapiro can buy ads and fucking run fake stories about this laptop. Maybe the, the laptop story itself it actually happened and it's true and it did, although it happened years prior to when it was being talked about prior to the election. I mean, they're they're obviously distorting the truth here. There's nothing solid or, I mean, there's really nothing to it in terms of like legal ramifications for Joe Biden's presidency. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's, that's the one startling thing is that to the extent that Joe is mentioned at all in any of the and, and there was you know there's tens of thousands of emails most of them were just nonsense so the, the, that number gets thrown around a lot uh, you know i've heard ben shapiro talk about well there's tens of thousands of emails that come out yeah most of them were like spam and just random nonsense all the ones that had any anything remotely of substance were released and this is basically what we got these these different stories this is one of those i would fucking put the band hammer on it has such a big influence on the outcome of the election, man. And it's obvious they were they were pumping this story up and fucking misrepresenting it all to hell, right? For sure, 100%. On Facebook, they were outright lying about it. I'm, I guarantee it because they have- the Oh, yeah, for sure. But yeah, I mean, this is what I wanted to end this on was, or like this last little segment that I wanted to do on this was that the attempt to censor it to whatever degree is what made it blow up. Because like, there, there's just, there's no way okay. to actually censor it. I think so, yeah. They would have been crying about censorship if they hadn't done any censorship. But but because there actually was censorship, I I, I think it gave it some legs. Yeah. So I don't know. Um, oh gosh, there's such there's down the line consequences though of letting lies just go out of control, man. 
That's how fucking fascist takeovers happen. Lies about the Jews in Germany. Okay, so this is actually uh, come out after I did the uh, start of this segment. I have to skip around a little bit because I don't have any timestamps on this. So yeah, this is uh, Sam Harris talking about just this issue, whether or not the Hunter Biden story should have been censored, and in the future, what should we do? And he makes some pretty pretty wild remarks about it, garnered a lot of attention. You know, disinformation at the last minute to who knows how this election is going to go? Who know who knows what the capacity for disinformation at the last minute to to tip the balance is? Then what do you do with the Hunter Biden laptop story when we already know we we know how this played out in 2016 with the Hillary Clinton email you know press conference where, where Comey in a, in, a, in, a, in an abundance of scrupulosity felt like he had to come before the cameras I think 10 days out from the election and say. You know, we've we're going to open up this this investigation again. Listen, I don't care what's in Hunter Biden's. I mean, Hunter Biden at that point, Hunter Biden literally could have had had the corpses of children in his basement. I would not have cared. Right. It's like it's there's nothing. First of all, it's Hunter Biden. Right. It's not it's like it's not Joe Biden. But even if Joe, like even the, whatever scope of Joe Biden's corruption is like if you if we could just go down that rabbit hole endlessly and and understand that he's getting kickbacks from Hunter Biden's deals in Ukraine or wherever else, right, or China. It is infinitesimal compared to the corruption we know Trump is involved in. Oh, so that's the argument Sam Harris makes. It's, uh, I guess, kind of like a, like a utilitarian argument. He morphed it into a utilitarian argument about Trump. Yeah, well, he, he, he's saying that, I guess, even from like a purely political standpoint, that it should have been suppressed because the potential damage done by Trump was so exponentially greater than the potential damage that would be done by Biden if all the stories, even if all the stories in the uh, purported emails turned out to be true. That's such bullshit, true. dude. That's given so much power to the fucking capitalists who own these social media companies. He's He has the right conclusion but he doesn't have the right framing his whole framing is based around this fear of trump it's bullshit the problem is the fucking capitalism it's not it's not the, it's what do we do just black out the entire fucking media a month out what do we do what's this what's his solution stupid yeah it seems and you're making he's going down the censorious route that's his solution this is censor fucking media and yeah well yeah and he's putting the power in people that you or i i don't think would consider to be good actors to make these really consequential decisions instead of, I guess, kind of addressing more systemic issues about, about how these things are portrayed in the first place. He's just going to not address that, how, how the media, how these big tech companies uh, put this information out there and just, yeah, like you said, give them the power to make decisions in favor of one politician versus another based on you know Sam's consequentialist evaluation of, of who's going to be more dangerous. Yeah, man. Like we've known forever, like capitalism is not congruent with democracy. You can make it sort of work if you have strict safeguards in place that some countries have some of. It takes a lot of work to try and fucking fit a round peg into a square hole in that scenario. It's a lot easier just to get rid of the fucking problem. The, 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 the incentives created by capitalist organization of, of economics is not conducive to democracy, dude, especially in terms of media. And there's no state media at all in this country. There's fucking NPR who gets 1% of their funding from the government and is constantly <laughs> shit on by Ben Shapiro. It's ridiculous. Cancel Big Bird. We can look at the paintings. Yeah, how much? How awesome is Hunter? Not only is he fucking awesome, but he can paint better than I can. I can't do this shit. Look at this. It does look kind of cool. Hang on. The one with the flowers, that looks nice. I like, you like that. that one? Yeah, I like that one. It's big. That'd I be like, cool to have in your house. I like but. nature, man. I, I love, you know, I love flowers. I love nature. I thought it was one space, of them. Yeah, it's definitely flowers. I think you're right. One of them kind of looks like a vagina. This one's cool. Yeah. I like that. You don't like that, do you? See, art is, you, it's, is individualistic. Yeah, right? It's all right. Uh, I like the, yeah, I like the nature stuff. I like the bird over here on the far left. That one looks cool. Which one? The trees? The, the Yeah, the chick. No, the chick. Oh, the trees are cool. The chick is too noisy. What's it say? much glare i can't read it yeah it's way fucking better than i I can't paint none of this shit is that worth uh is that worth two million dollars in back taxes and uh and the lawyer to handle it i wonder if he did all these paintings on on crack i no no i don't think you could do that on crack really no what drug it. is conducive for art like that you could do it on x maybe I no know, i don't maybe. think you could yeah no no nothing. i don't no serotonin or for sure. Maybe uh, it had to be myth or something like that. Yeah, maybe. 
I don't know. There's a lot of really good. Uh, so I follow. Uh, I like that one a lot. There's a lot of good stuff that people will put up on r slash LSD that they did while they were tripping. Really? It's it's there's a discontinuity. Like it's not a you can tell it's from a intoxicated mind, I guess. Yeah, you don't have any coordination. You don't have like the uh, hand eye coordination. I would think. All right, man. That's gonna, all right. It's gonna do it. Sounds good, buddy. James, peace. Signing off. See you next week, buddy. And sit down to promote his new memoir aired today on CBS This Morning. In it, he talked about dating his late brother's widow. Hunter Biden is speaking about one of the strangest events in his train wreck life, his affair with his brother's widow.